Behold the wonders of the missing link between dinosaurs and birds. The Archaeoraptor! That's the informal generic name for this creature, discovered in China and published in National Geographic magazine in 1999. Purported to be an excellent example of the link between dinosaurs and birds, showing off the wonders of evolution. Truly magical. Also, this isn't real! Yeah... Yeah, this was a... This was a pretty major scandal um, for National Geographic. They did not do their due diligence, which is unfortunate because that's like their whole thing. Their entire corporate structure centers around the idea that they deliver the facts regarding the natural world. And yet, this, um, not animal managed to pass through the cracks. What we're looking at here is not a real animal or the remains of one. Well, it is. It's a fossil chimera. A fake fossil, effectively, though constructed out of real ones. The story begins in July of 1997, over in China, where farmers had been routinely digging in the shale pits with picks and would find fossils on occasion. They would then sell them to dealers for just a few dollars. It was technically illegal for them to do that, but, um, eh, nobody's looking, and the farmers needed money. But the reason paleontologists get so hung up on this kind of problem is that often these dealers don't really handle the fossils with care. For example, in one instance, a farmer actually found a really rare fossil of a toothed bird that even had feather impressions. But this fossil wound up breaking into pieces while they were getting it out. But this would lead to our Archaeoraptor, because nearby in the same pit, he also found pieces that included a feathered tail and legs. He cemented several of these pieces together in a manner that he thought was correct. Of course, he, he wasn't, but he thought it was right. And he knew that this would make it look more complete and thus worth a lot more. He sold it in June of 1998 to an anonymous dealer and it was smuggled into the United States. It had to be smuggled because according to authorities in Beijing, it's actually illegal for any fossil to leave China. Any fossils found in China must stay there and be given to the proper scientific minds in order to actually study them. But uh, yeah, the fossil was sent over to the United States. Of course, as I mentioned, this fossil was not put together properly in any way. But by the fall of 1998, an annual meeting of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology that's held in Utah, there were rumors floating around about a rather striking fossil of a very primitive bird, but it was currently in private hands. Paleontologists don't like that. They don't like private individuals to own these fossils because it means that they can't actually, you know, study them. But if the fossil was that interesting and that unique, they really wanted to get a look at it. It was presented by an anonymous dealer at a gem show in Tucson, Arizona. The Dinosaur Museum in Blanding, Utah managed to purchase it in February of 1999. That museum was run by Stephen A. Zirkus who was an American sculptor and paleontologist himself, though he did not actually hold a university degree, but he was well known as a pretty knowledgeable individual despite being effectively self-taught. His sculptures of dinosaurs were among the first to include things like feathers, so he definitely contributed positively to science, and the fossil of course intrigued him. He arranged for patrons of his museum, including a trustee, Dale Slade, to provide $80,000 to purchase this thing, so it could be studied scientifically, and prevent it from disappearing into a private collection. He had good intentions, of course, but um, as we are well aware, this um, this fossil was not worth $80,000, not even close. Circus and his wife Sylvia then contacted another paleontologist, Phil Curie, who did graduate from university, and he would in turn contact the National Geographic Society. Curie agreed to study the fossil because of course he wanted to get a look at it, but only on the condition that it was eventually returned to China, because everyone knew that technically speaking this fossil shouldn't even be in the United States. It was Chinese, it was supposed to be there. Its very existence in the States was technically a violation of the law. He was gonna look at it, cause he might as well, but he did want it sent back. The National Geographic Society intended to get it formally published in the peer-reviewed science journal, Nature, and then follow immediately with a press conference, as well as an issue of their own magazine, National Geographic. 
The editor, Bill Allen, asked that all members of the project keep the whole thing a secret so they would get the big scoop. However, prior to the publication in National Geographic, Circus was convinced to give the fossil back to China immediately after it went public. They didn't want an issue with the Chinese government. Circus gave in, and Curie contacted the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology in Beijing to explain the situation. National Geographic even flew the IVPP's Zhu Xing to Utah to be part of the team to look at the fossil. Chinese authorities were perfectly willing to let National Geographic publish the whole thing as long as they'd get the fossil back as they were supposed to. So it seemed like, so far, everything was going quite well. Except the whole part of the problem that this whole thing isn't real. During the initial examination of the fossil on March 6, 1999, Curie already felt something was wrong here. I mean, he was a paleontologist. He had to know something was up if he was worth his salt, and he did. He noticed that the left and right feet mirrored each other perfectly, and the fossil had been completed by using both slab and counter slab. He also found that there was no connection between the tail and the body, and all this was pretty fucking suspect, like this wasn't normal. There was something funny going on. In July of 1999, Curie, as well as the circuses, brought the fossil to the high-resolution X-ray CT facility of the University of Texas to make scans of it to get a better look at what was going on here. Dr. Timothy Rowe, who worked at the university, made the scans on July 29th, and he observed that the bottom fragments that showed the tail and the lower legs weren't actually part of the larger fossil. He told the circuses on August 2nd that there was actually a chance that the whole thing was, um, fake. That this wasn't real. He didn't say that for sure, but there were a lot of red flags. But the circuses were afraid of losing the publication. That would be major for the museum. Even if they had to give the fossil back, it would still be their museum's name in National Geographic. That was good for them. And they pressured both Roe and Curie to keep their reservations about the fossil private for now. In the first week of September, Curie would send his preparer, Kevin Olenbach, to the Dinosaur Museum to prepare the fossil for better study. Olenbach, who was also an expert, uh, took one look at this and said, This is a... this is a chimera. This is a composite specimen of at least three different animals, with a maximum of possibly five. But the circuses got mad at him and denied this, and Olenbach only told Curie about it. Curie decided not to tell National Geographic about these issues. On August 13th, 1999, the team would submit a manuscript titled A New Tooth Bird with a Dromaeosaur-like Tail under the names of Stephen Circus, Curie, Rowe, and Zoo to the journal Nature in London. But on August 20th, Nature decided to reject the paper, indicating to the circuses, the National Geographic had refused to delay their own publication, leaving too little time for a peer review, which is what they wanted. They wanted other paleontologists to look at it and uh, make sure everything was on the level here. And at this point, only a few people knew and were well aware that it wasn't. A peer review would make that abundantly clear, but National Geographic wouldn't budge, so Nature didn't want to touch it. They then submitted the paper to Science, who did send it out for peer review. Two reviewers informed science that the specimen was smuggled out of China and illegally purchased, which everyone was already well aware of, and that the fossil had been doctored in China to enhance its value. Based on this, science also rejected the paper. According to Sloan, the circuses didn't actually tell National Geographic about the details of those two rejections. The November issue of National Geographic that had Archaeoraptor in it, was already preparing for printing, even though Archaeoraptor hadn't been formally published in any peer-reviewed journal. They went ahead and published without that, and the fossil was officially unveiled in a press conference on October 15, 1999. In November, National Geographic did contain an article by Christopher P. Sloan, who was one of their art editors. He described the fossil as a missing link that helped elucidate the connection between dinosaurs and birds. The original fossil was put on display at the National Geographic Society in Washington, D.C., pending its return over to China. 
Sloan was the one who used the name Archaeoraptor leonigensis, but with a disclaimer, so it wouldn't actually count as an official scientific classification. In anticipation of Circus being able to publish a peer-reviewed description at some point in the future. He just did that to be fancy. But after publication, of course, there were naysayers, people who had issues with the whole thing. After the November issue of National Geographic came out, Storrs L. Olson, who was curator of birds in the National Museum of Natural History of the Smithsonian Institution, published himself an open letter, pointing out that the specimen in question is known to have been illegally exported, and Olson took issue with the prevailing dogma that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Yeah, that's ridiculous. How dare you suggest that, National Geographic? I don't know why anyone would think that's the case. Olson was, was, was wrong. Um, it was 1999, it still hadn't been, like, solidified yet, but, uh, yeah, Olson was wrong. However, he complained that Sloan, a journalist, had usurped the process of scientific nomenclature by publishing a name first in the popular press, which is kind of true. Even with a disclaimer, it was kind of unprofessional of Sloan to do that. Olson called it the worst nightmare of many zoologists, that their chance to name a new organism will be inadvertently scooped by some witless journalist, which... <laughs> Yo, <laughs> harsh, but eh. But in any way, Zoo was of course involved in this. Did he know there were problems with the specimen? Well, just the previous month in October, Zoo was informed of the issues, and he also knows that the tail of Archaeoraptor strongly resembled an unnamed mini Raptoran dinosaur that he was already studying. This would later be named Microraptor Zalanus. He would return to China and travel to Liaoning province, where he inspected the site where the fossil had been found initially, and contacted several of the dealers that he was well familiar with. He actually managed to find a fairly complete fossil of a tiny dromaeosaur, and the tail of that new fossil corresponded exactly to the tail of Archaeoraptor, to the point that it had to be the counter slab. There was no other way. On December 20th, 1999, Zhu Xing sent emails to the authors, as well as Sloan, announcing that the fossil was fake. On February 3rd, 2000, the National Geographic News issued a press release stating that the Archaeoraptor fossil might actually be a composite, and an internal investigation had begun. In the March issue of National Geographic, Zhu's letter ran in the farm section of the magazine and Bill Allen had Zoo changed the word fake to composite, which, to be fair, wasn't an unreasonable request. Because, well, yes, it technically is fake in the sense that this isn't a real animal, it is made up of real fossils, and therefore is technically real if you break them up into what they're supposed to be. On April 4th, 2000, Stephen Serkis told a group of paleontologists in Washington that he and Sylvia had made an idiot bone stupid mistake which yes yes you did curie allen and sloan all expressed their own regrets and roe felt pretty vindicated claiming the affair as evidence that his scans were correct which they were he would personally publish a brief communication in nature in 2001 to describe his own findings and concluded that apart from the top bit several specimens had actually been used in completing the fossil a first for the left femur, a second for the tibia, a third for both feet, and at least one more for the tail, which on its own consisted of five separate parts. On June 2000, the fossil was finally sent back to China, and in October of 2000, National Geographic published the results of their own internal investigation. It was a disaster, without any question. The circuses pushed too hard, wanting desperately to be in National Geographic, and Curie kind of abandoned his own professional ethics to allow this. He knew there was a problem, but did nothing about it until after the fact. But I guess everyone makes mistakes, and this particular scandal is still to this day sometimes referenced by creationists as proof that all fossils are fake. Yes, yes, just because this one was a composite, that means they're all fake. That's that's how that works. Shut up. But yes, creationists like Kent Hovind, who we've dealt with before, Kirk Cameron, and Ray Comfort have all cast doubt on the hypothesis that birds evolved from dinosaurs since they deny evolution in general. 
People like this commonly point to Archaeoraptor as evidence of misconduct performed to support the evolutionary theory, comparing it to something like the Piltdown Man. But the difference here is that Archaeoraptor wasn't intentionally made to support an evolutionary claim. The farmer made it just to make more money. He likely had no idea how far and problematic this would get. Plus, regardless of the authenticity of Archaeoraptor, it actually wouldn't have been essential proof for the hypothesis that birds are theropods. This is sufficiently corroborated by plenty of other data. It's really no longer disputed at all in the modern day. And even if you need some kind of missing link, as it's sometimes known, there are animals like Microraptor that are theorized to have been able to glide somewhat, but already clearly show signs of slowly becoming birds over time. The point is, Archaeoraptor wasn't exactly breaking new ground or some kind of startling revelation. It was very interesting, and definitely would have added to the mountain of evidence that dinosaurs evolved into birds at some point, but it, uh, well, it wasn't real. It was a composite, a chimera. Something made up. And it caused a lot of problems for a lot of people, because a handful of them just couldn't tell the friggin' truth. Guys. Why did you waste everyone's time? And with that, a special thank you goes out to my Apex Predators, Dr. Racer78, Metal for Life Guy, and Arthur Roy. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.